already 8 o'clock, or a little bit after 8 o'clock. Um, and Father Peter said today, or this evening, my talk is on the life of the Theotokos. I actually talk about the life of the Theotokos up to the Nativity. So the life of the, the Theotokos pre-Gospel, right? Because that is um, usually the period of her life most people are curious about, especially if you're a catechumen inquirer or convert. Because as a, a Protestant convert myself, my husband and I were chrismated in 1998 um, out of the Wesleyan Church. Um, we had very little to no, zero, knowledge of the Theotokos. So um, we were eager to learn about her and her life um, previous to the Nativity, to the birth of Christ. So that's the area that I focus on. Um, and I get my information from... The, the Life of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos. I think we have this set of volumes also in the library. So if you're interested, you might snatch it up if it's there today or keep your eye out maybe later to pick it up. Um, it's actually a complete set. Um, there's a Life of the Apostles. There's a Life of, uh, what's another one I saw there? It was, looked really interesting. Um, Women Martyrs? Women Martyrs, yes, that was neat. But there's a bunch. There's a lot of them. They're all good, but that's where I get a bulk of my information is out of this particular. I feel like I'm doing a book talk. I'm a librarian, so everything is like, doing a book talk. This, book <coughs> is about, this is a really good series, all of them, though, but this one is on the life of the Theotokos. So I will say, first and foremost, this is from a catechumen inquirer kind of level. If you <coughs> came for a lecture, you came the wrong night. That's Dr. Creighton. <laughs> I just talk. I have the spiritual gift of gab, so that's what I do. I just talk, um, and I'm always nervous when I give this kind of presentation simply because, not necessarily because of being in front of people, it has more to do with, it's an important subject matter, and I want to do her justice. I want to do the Theotokos justice in honor of her and what I say um, and the information that I give out, so just so you know, not a lecture. This is just a talk, not academic. Um, I usually begin with how I met the Theotokos. And uh, my husband and I have uh, four children, and all four of them are on the spectrum at some level. Um, but my second son out of the four uh, was considered moderate to severe. So about two years, I don't know, somewhere after one and somewhere before four, he, he screamed for two years, pretty much constantly. So constantly um, overstimulated. So we had to get really, really creative when it came to sleep because he would just sleep maybe, I don't know, a handful of hours in a week. And so Steve and I would take turns doing strange things to, to try to let each other sleep um, and also to help him to sleep and be safe because if, if we didn't, he might elope is the is the term for it can you hear me jerry <laughs> so um elope meaning he would find uh creative and interesting ways to get out of the house so no matter how many locks or bells we put on the door like my my door at home was like walmart Dee -dee. every time somebody went out the door just to make sure we knew if someone exited the building so um Many, many nights, because Steve worked third shift, um, we would try to get him to lay down in bed, and then I would sit on the floor next to the bed, and I would put my arm across him like this, so then I would know if he woke up. And then I'd just kind of lean my head back against the wall, and I would try to sleep. So we did that quite a while, and obviously I spent many nights where I didn't sleep very well, or much at all, and um, there was just one particular night that uh, it had been a long time and I was very tired and I was very very discouraged and um, I don't know despair that word comes to mind where it's been so long and, and you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel and usually that's when um, you start getting attacked right in your mind because you're low so suddenly I just really felt oppressed like I kept thinking things like um, you know, 
nobody understands, nobody will ever understand, we are alone, we are isolated, we are, we are the only people in the world to ever experience anything like this, you know, other things would come to me about him, I would be like, you know, the world will never accept him, he will have no place, you know, he will always be alone, he will always, blah, blah, and this stuff would constantly, like, and I would constantly come back to me, no one understands, no one understands, and I had a, uh, an icon of the Theotokos over his bed that my brother had made. And it was just like suddenly a voice kind of came into my mind when I looked at her picture. I thought, there is one person that knows exactly how you feel. And not that my kid is in comparison to Jesus Christ, but it was that idea of a mother that looked at her son and knew there is no place in the world for my son. She felt what I felt. So that from that point on, um, I felt very connected to the Theotokos, and I pray every morning that she'll stretch over her veil of protection over my children, every morning, um, because I trust that she, I had walked in her shoes, she had walked in my shoes, so I know that she knows where I've been and how I felt, and I trust her, and so... The Theotokos uh, became um, a person that I go to often for my children. Um, yeah. So first off, um, when I'm talking about her life, I kind of think of her life when I do this talk like chapters in a book. Yeah. Amazing, right? My brain thinks of a chapter in a book. But I do. I think of like three chapters, right? I think about kind of her heritage, her life like her upbringing, she has a very unique upbringing, and then when she comes of age, those three aspects. Once she comes of age, then the Gospels begin, right? All of that is, but everything previous to that is um, not quite so well known. Um, the first thing I do want to talk about, though, is uh, the place of the Theotokos in the church, because I think it's important. I never understood why, um, before she like, converted why her place in the church was so important and what it represented. Okay, it was just like a character in a book, right? It was just one more person in the Gospels that they talk about. But I, I wasn't sure, it didn't make any sense to me, why was she that important to the faith and to the church? Um, the mystery of the incarnation is central to Orthodox teaching, and at the heart of that is the Theotokos. And let's clear up a couple of terms, too, because I'm going to use them, and they can be a little confusing because used in a Western context, then it can take on a different meaning. So we'll make sure we're getting that accurately. So when we call Mary immaculate and all pure, it's as a manifestation of the orthodox understanding of salvation as deification. Okay, she is the example, right, representation of Salvation is de deification, meaning she was not born without sin when we say immaculate. We don't say that. Um, that's a very Western belief. Orthodox Christians believe that through the grace of God, Mary has been deified <clears throat> or made by grace what God is by nature, right? She partakes of the divine nature. Not that she was born without sin and all that. Not, not that at all. That's not the Orthodox perceptive. We would say, as St. Paul writes, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness, the Theotokos, from one degree of glory to another. She's just a physical example of what that looks like in a life lived out. That is the Theotokos. So salvation for Orthodox is more than forgiveness of sins or justification. It is a transformation of the believer by the grace of God, to become a partaker of the divine nature. So Orthodox Christians see the realization of this salvation in deification in Mary, the Theotokos. So when we talk about it, we talk about the salvation and deification. The first person we look to is the Theotokos, the first example, right? We call her the first Christian. We call her mother, and that's we do that in the liturgy. Um, if you listen really closely, there's many times we, not only just in the, um, you know, when we cross ourselves and we say the prayer to Theotokos, but there's many other times in services 
throughout the whole cycle that we will talk about or we'll sing hymns <clears throat> about the Theotokos. Iconography, it's all over the church. Different aspects of her life, she's also there. And you know, in this experience of the saints, we see the mother of God. So if you read the lives of the saints, there are so many times she's appeared to the saints, have intervened in the lives of the saints in miraculous ways, that she's an active participant in the kingdom of heaven. So it isn't just like, oh, they die and then go away. That they're actively involved in those that cloud of witnesses in their lives, and that's why it's okay to call on the mother of God, to the Theotokos, just for personal care. That's when I call on her a lot. Um, Something else that we call the mother of God, we call Mary, is the second Eve. St. Irenaeus of Lyon wrote, uh, Mary is the second Eve whose obedience liberates humanity from the consequences of the disobedience of the first Eve. For this reason, on the feast of the nativity of Mary, Orthodox Christians will sing, the mother of life, who is the renewal of the creation of Adam and the recall of Eve, the fountain of incorruption, the liberation from corruption, through whom we have been deified and delivered from death, is born to the seed of David dispersing darkness. Um, sometimes we don't think about or we forget, you know, Mary could have refused to bear Christ. God doesn't, you know, subject us to his will. You know, you're not forced to. She could have refused Christ, but she chose obedience. And that speaks to her example of what salvation and deification look like. It didn't occur to her. She was simply obedient. That's the example to us. What we're trying to be is to be obedient. All right. Chapter 1. I'm going to take you through to the gospel. So starting with her parentage, what we know about Joachim and Anna was they were well-respected elders in the community. Uh, Joachim was of the tribe of Judah from Nazareth of Galilee. Um, and Anna was the daughter of Nathan, the priest of the tribe of Lehi, Le Lehi. I worked at Lehi. Levi from Bethlehem of Judea. What we know about Joachim is he was the shepherd of his own sheep. Think about what does that shepherd of his own sheep? Anybody wager a guess why that's important? What that would mean just kind of logically, shepherd of his own sheep. He was wealthy. He was wealthy. Yeah, he was. He uh, was well established. Right. He was a, a, a well established man. Um, he was known for his love of God, his generosity, and his tithing and giving to the poor. So he kept a rule, Joachim. He was since he was 15 years old, he would give a third to the poor, a third to the temple, and only keep a third for his household. And that's how Joachim lived his life. Um, and as I said, they were a very respected couple out in the community. And something else that is definitely worth um, talking about is when I say in the community, when we talk about the life of Joachim and Anna and the Theotokos, um, in this particular culture, in this time, it was true community. So they celebrated together. They mourned together. They were a part of people's life. That something tragic was happening. They all experienced it together. That's the kind of community this was. So anything that Joachim and Anna were going through, the whole community was going through with them. And as Orthodox, that's kind of what we strive for, what we need to be to one another, experiencing mourning or grieving or celebrating um, together as a family. So 50 years, um, Joachim and Anna are married. So when I say elders, I mean elders. They've been married 50 years. They are not a young couple. They are quite an old couple. Uh, and they have no children. They pray and pray and pray. They even vow to God they will give this child in service if they will just, he will just grant them a child. So we have to think about first, now why is this a problem? Also for, from my convert perspective, not knowing much about the mother of God, it didn't really occur to me why that was such a problem. Like, it's sad, right? I mean, it's sad that they really wanted kids and they didn't get to have them, but coming from the time that we're in, uh, it doesn't have the same connotations that it does here. All Jewish parents hoped 
that they would bear the Messiah. Or at least their children would live long enough to see the Messiah born in their generation. So every time a child was born to families, there was a hope. You were going to give birth to the Messiah in your family. That was always the hope. So everyone, that was one reason why you continually you wanted to have children. Um, another aspect would be the lack of motherhood in this culture was regarded as a reproach or a curse. A humiliation that would even give them grounds for divorce, which really wasn't done. But it was actually one of the very few things at that time that you could get a divorce over. A curse from God meant to them extinction. It was viewed as a societal judgment on a childless woman. Having no children was existing in name only. Because once you were passed, you passed away, your line is done. So you live on in your children, and they thought not having children meant extinction. Even affecting their daily life, most of the greetings at this time for married couples, the salutation always made reference to your children. So every time they met someone in public, it was a reminder that she felt like a failure, like he felt like a failure, like there was something they had done terribly wrong, even in their salutations. So it wasn't just, as we would see it in this day and time, oh, it's kind of sad, you know, that you can't have kids. It was a reproach, and it was kind of a humiliation for them in their community. So just when you think things can't get worse, the Feast of the Dedication rolls around, and that's Hanukkah. And this is when devout believers go to the temple and make their sacrifices, and they're met at the door by the high priest. And for the very first time, because it has been 50 years, their sacrifice is refused, and the priest actually turns them away. So they get all the way to the temple, and you know there's a lot of people, right? They're all gathering in the temple to give their sacrifice, and the priest singles them out and tells them, basically, until you sort out this childlessness, don't come back. And the temple was the life, the center of their entire life and culture, right? And he's saying, you're cut off. Don't come back here. You can't sacrifice again until you sort out why you're childless. Well, of course, they're humiliated. They're publicly humiliated, and they're respected, well-known people in this community. Um, so jo Joachim. Joachim immediately goes to research. He's thinking, you know, we can't be the only couple. I can't be the only one that has not raised up seed in Israel. I, I can't be. Not being able to bear any shame, he finally goes through all this research, finds out he is the only registered male <laughs> family that has it. So it's just, you know, another another wound on top of a wound for this poor man. And he's had enough. So he takes off into the mountains with his sheep to fast and pray. And Anna goes home and locks herself in the house to fast and pray. Because usually the women would gather around them in such a tragic time. They would gather around each other, right? And the opposite happens. They shut themselves away. But you know, the amazing thing and example these people are to us, what is the first thing they thought to do? They fast and pray because they wanted an answer from God. You know, I don't know what I, I would like to think I would lock myself away and fast and pray. I feel sorry for myself quite a bit, so I might have a lot of self-pity. Who knows, right? You know, being a human person just says a lot about their character and about their walk with God that that's the first thing they did. Maybe that should be the first thing that we do, yeah, when tragedy strikes. So they fast, they pray, um, and all pretty much seems lost. I mean, what are the odds after 50 years of marriage that this old woman is going to be able to have a child? I mean, pretty much the door, I'm sure she felt like the door had closed on that a very long time ago for her. But what we do know is when God shuts the womb of anyone, he does so that he may in a more wonderful manner open it so that which is born may be acknowledged to be not just a product of man, but a gift of God. 
right? It's a miracle. He used this to create a miracle. So both Joachim and Anna are visited by the angel of the Lord, and they're both told the same thing. Your prayers and charitable deeds have not run unnoticed. Anna will have a daughter, and you will name her Mary, and devoted to the Lord from infancy and filled with the spirit she will be from her mother's womb. They are told she is not to eat or drink anything unclean, and they are told her life will not be among the crowds, but in the temple of the Lord. Because remember, they promised, if you'll just give us a child, we'll give that child back to you in service. And so he said, the angel tells them to get up and go find one another at the Golden Gate. And they both come to the Golden Gate to find one another and meet um, and then return to the temple to tell everyone what had happened. They celebrate, enjoy, they sacrifice, and they go home and conceive the mother of God. There's actually a beautiful icon of the conception of the mother of God. I don't think we have one. We might. Look it up online. Google it. It's on there. It's a beautiful, beautiful icon um, of the conception of the mother of God. So... Chapter 2, the Nativity. So the whole community rejoices. This is another one of those interesting things, unique things about her life and about this culture that she's brought up in. Um, So they don't just, everybody's like, oh, that's great, you know. You know, and on are having a baby. It's an enormous celebration, right? Because remember I said these people live in community. So that means they have mourned with her. They have lived these 50 years praying for her, trying to support her, trying to support this family and be a part of one another's lives. So when this child is born, it's a huge community celebration, not just the two of them. It's everyone celebrating with them. And so Joachim and Anna, they follow the angel's instructions, this kind of unique upbringing. They prepare a room for her in their house that's just hers. Um, Usually children are, people help with their upbringing, usually uh, young women will come in and help raise children, you know, take the village, it really did then, take a village. Um, and they made sure she was attended by virgin maidens only. And on her very first birthday, she is presented in the temple to the high priest. She is such a celebrated child, which is unheard of because she is not male. She's not the first male in her family, she's a girl. But the high priest still gives her a special blessing on her first birthday. Um, And as she grows up, by year two, by the time she's two years old, they make good on their vow to God. And they bring her to the temple, led by her caretakers. And the description we get are their lamps and singings, and she walks up the steps by herself at two. And she dwells in the temple with other virgins and is beloved by all. And she is actually allowed in the Holy of Holies. And she's fed by the angels, we're told. So it wasn't uncommon that children were raised in the temple like this. So you would think um, she's not alone. There are other uh, virgin maidens that are often raised in the temple as such. Um, And they spend most of their uh, childhood in the temple. Educated, they live a life of prayer. Their life is in the temple. So just like the angel of the Lord told them, she wasn't raised in the crowds. She was raised in the temple. That was her life, um, the life of the temple. So chapter three, all is good until she comes of age. The Theotokos comes of age. So you have this holy um, young woman now, probably 12 or 13, Right? She's been raised in the temple. She's never eaten anything unclean. And that's been her life, right? Of prayer, of fasting, pretty much an ascetic, an example of asceticism, right? This has been her entire life. So she turns 13. And this is typically when the temple then arranges for all those young women that have been raised in the temple to then be uh, either betro- sent home, betrothed something they find a place they don't just turn them out they find a place for each young woman to go to majority of the time it's marriage 
um, in this culture that young women are then betrothed to someone. This is a problem because Mary, at this point, has taken a vow of celibacy before God. So her parents have passed, so she can't go home. Um, so now Zacharias has a problem. So what do we do about Mary? We can't send her home. She refuses to be wed because she's taken a vow of celibacy. Um, and even as a high priest, if the, this woman has made a vow before God, he cannot ask her to break that vow. So they have a very unique problem in Mary in that they have nowhere for her to be because she can't stay in the temple. So Zacharias goes off into the Holy of Holies and he begins to pray that God would give him an answer, what he, how they can take care of her, because that's the goal. How do we take care of Mary? And he comes out with the answer that God tells him he, he needs to prepare a betrothal. But the betrothal will look more like uh, an entrustment, okay? Because you can be betrothed indefinitely, all right? It, because basically, uh, at this time, that is marriage uh, only without consummation. So you basically are married, right? Uh, but it's not a consummated marriage. So it looks more like an entrustment. So they get this great idea. So here's how we're going to do it. All the tribes are going to draw lots. And whoever draws the short lot, right? It's five, five, the short straw. No, it's the long straw. I don't know. Uh, is responsible for her. And it falls to Judah. So then the tribe of Judah has to get together and say, all right, all the eligible widowers were summoned. All of them had to come in. Uh, to the temple for selection. One particular widower was the man named Joseph of Nazareth. And he was 80 years old and had recently been widowed after 40 years of marriage to his wife, Salome. He already had seven children, adults, and just wanted to be obedient, right? You call the widower, and he's a, a man of God and faithful to the temple, so he, he shows up, right, because that's what's expected of him, and he wants to be obedient. He's not expecting anything. Each widower is to bring a rod with him, and those rods are all collected, <laughs> and then they are placed in the Holy of Holies. And it says, or God speaks to Zacharias and says, the rod that buds is the caretaker of Mary. Simple enough, right? So they gather all the rods together. And Mary puts them all in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> he prays, and he looks down. None of them are budded. <laughs> so poor Zacharias, thinking that he had his, everything was going to be solved, it's, it's great, it's going to all work out, is now frustrated. Okay? So the angel of the Lord then speaks to him. He puts on his robe, he goes back in there. Now he's really in earnest this time, right? Because he knows he's in a bind. It did nothing happen like it was supposed to. And the angel of the Lord says, you missed one. Uh, so he goes back in. He's looking around. And there's this very small rod in the corner that he hadn't noticed before. So poor Joseph, because he was so embarrassed of his great age and appearance, but he didn't tell anyone he didn't get his rod back. <laughs> he was just kind of said, okay, yeah, somebody else that's a little younger and maybe more, a better place for her. But Zacharias brings out the rod, uses this, right? Joseph has to say, come on, <laughs> from the back. And he hands him the rod, and it buds immediately in his hands. So, all are congratulating him for this great honor to take her into his care. Remember, it's an entrustment. This child is a child of the community, right? A child of the temple. And it's an honor. It's an enormous honor to be entrusted with her care in your home. And Joseph says, Why do you hand over to me this infant that is younger than my grandsons? I fear lest I should appear ridiculous in Israel. 
you know, he's 80 and he has a 12-year-old. And all his kids are grown, right? So he's saying, what do you want me to do with uh, this young girl in my house? So they send with him caretakers, um, several different young women to live with her in his house to help take care of her. And so she'll have companionship. And Joseph becomes her proper guardian. And so when they are betrothed, they are married but married without that consummation. So currently, now that Mary is in his house and taken <coughs> care of, the problem of Mary is solved until the Gospels start. <laughs> and then we have the Nativity of Christ. So that is my presentation. Any questions? I know if I can't answer them, Father Peter's here. <laughs> right, nativity. Right, I have 45 minutes, man. I'm doing my best. What about the old woman? Behold your son. Right? Yeah, I try to keep it everything pre gospels because that's mostly what people don't know anything about. So then tonight you can go home and start reading the gospels before Lent to fill in the blanks. But I didn't know if anybody had any questions specifically about her life previous. Yes. So where does Mary? Twelve or thirteen? Yeah, yeah. She stays in his home, and, and like I said, it's more um, what you would call an entrustment. So since she had no well, one else, widowed with just children, needed someone your son's well established has been supporting that they knew she would have much, care, you know, outside her whole home life. Because obviously, women had health care. care. You that, had that to particular time. Yes, and I'm sure a lot of our, our information that come out of this series is, is probably traditionally handed down from him and from those conversations. And yeah, she was um, a huge part of the apostles' lives until, until her death. Um, and they loved and cared for her. Um, and she was a, a leader in the faith. So kind of cool. Anything else? Why they would send their daughters to the temple, but then at a certain age they're like, well, like, if you send, in more recent life, like if you sent your daughter to like the monastery and like you explained to me before, they would either go get married or they'd be permanently and stay at the monastery. So why would they send them to the temple just to then be like, well, you're of age, so. Yeah, childbearing. So remember they had all those different rules and regulations about women and menstruating. So as soon as they could bear children, Immediately, they had to do something with them, right? They couldn't stay in the temple that way. You know, they couldn't even go into the temple even after you give birth for so many days and all that, right? So once that window hit and they physically became able to have children, immediately they had to have a way to still care for those women, but they couldn't stay in the temple. So that's why with Mary it became a problem because it was like, what are we going to do with her? Because... She can't stay here. She can't go home. Her parents are dead, right? Her parents were old when she was born. So they've been gone a very long time um, out of her life. And then also, um, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. So typically, if one would take a vow of celibacy, then you'd go home with your parents as opposed to... Yes, and honestly, it really hadn't been done. I mean, she, for us, there's a lot of people would say that she is the first celibate, the first um, ascetic right? She's one that would do, because most of the time, you know, that, women, that's an expectation, right? That's just the expectation, yes. But she's kind of like that, that pre-first example of asceticism. So it was highly unusual. Women just didn't do that. So that's why it was such a problem, because you were just, you know, John the Baptist and, and men kind of did that kind of thing, but it was a little unusual for a woman to do that. Yes. Speak. Not religious, not, but in their culture and in ours, because we're sure we come out of all Jewish, 
when a couple gets married, the whole group celebrates, the whole church celebrates. Sure. The, the union, because these people have come together, we pray that God blesses and they're fruitful and they bring forth children. And when they have children, we celebrate with them because God's increasing our numbers and like they did this, like 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 they're our own family because they are our own family. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a beautiful thing that's totally different than a lot of understanding of things yeah. in our period. So when when a mother and father have her, it is a great celebration for the whole community because like our community We all gained a baby. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, 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 we all gained a baby. It's, it's awesome. The, the, the gift is to that family <laughs> in particular, but it's also to the church in general. Yeah. It's a gift to all of us. Yeah. Anybody else? Let's see if we don't. <laughs> then we can go home. One more. Yes. So in the temple, at those times, they took the roses from of all the the rulers of the tribes, right? Yes. All the children yes. that were born. They are very good at keeping records. This is one thing they're very good at is, is keeping records of, of their people. So, yeah, a lot of things were easy to find to go back quite a ways. Uh, they kept in the temple those kinds of records. I guess if that's all. Oh, one more. <coughs> when the angels would pull Joachim and Anna. Uh, the goddess shall eat nothing unclean. What they made unclean. That is a good question. Father Peter. <laughs> 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 Actually, there, there, yeah, I mean, it's their general, I think it's just their, their general, um, Prescribed uh, by the law. In this testament, um, in the book of Acts, uh, St. Peter has a vision, and in this vision there's this light or a sheet that's lowered down from heaven, and it's got all of these things in it, including things that are considered unclean. And, um, uh, and, and, and God or an angel of the Lord tells him in this vision uh, that. Uh, he should take it and eat it. And St. Peter says, I know you're eating unclean. And, and, and the angel says, you know, what I have what I have said is, is clean as much as unclean. So, so in the New Testament now, in the New Testament times, ever since then, um, we can have foods that were forbidden in the Old Covenant. So we don't talk about unclean. We don't hear unclean a whole lot anymore. Well, meat versus Like pork. pork. Cake. You can have bacon oh. now. I'm very thankful for it. Like when we go to the farm, you know, (laughs) this is my favorite. Thank you very much for your time. I so appreciate it.